I'm a journalist and I've covered the racial divisions in this country for the past 25 years. But the story that has taught me the most about how we get past those divisions is a story that I was too ashamed to tell. It's a story about my mother, about my family, and about the power of a hopeless cause. And like many stories, mine begins with a mystery. I grew up in an inner city black neighborhood in Baltimore without ever knowing my mother. She vanished from my life not long after I was born. No one in my family told me why she disappeared. I didn't know what she looked like or even if she was alive. All I was told was this, your mother's name is Shirley, she's white, and her family hates black people. Their hatred was not surprising. When I was born in the mid-1960s, interracial marriage was illegal in much of the country. When my father first went to date my mom, her father answered the door, tried to shove him off the doorstep, called him the N-word, and had him arrested. But my parents continued to see one another, though they faced constant harassment from people in public, as well as from members in their own family. I developed this deep hostility toward white people when I grew up that went beyond my mother's family rejection. Nobody in my neighborhood seemed to like white people, and we hardly ever saw them, except in positions of authority like teachers or police officers. During my entire time in school, public school, from Head Start to high school, I only saw one white student in any of my schools. It wasn't a time or place to have a white mother. There was no Obama or other public figures who were biracial. So I became a closeted biracial person. I told my friends, my mom's black, and I marked her race as black on school forms. And in times, my, na my neighborhood would become famous. It became the setting for the HBO series, The Wire, which depicts a black inner city neighborhood torn apart by violence and racism. And in 2015, it became the epicenter for the riots that erupted after a young black man named Freddie Gray died in police custody. But my perspective began to change with an unexpected meeting. After I turned 17, I was driven to this massive red brick building on the outskirts of, on the outskirts of Maryland with my younger brother, Patrick. We were led into a waiting room. As we stood in the waiting room, we could hear people moaning in pain in the background while others were laughing hysterically. A hospital orderly escorted a thin white woman into the room. And when she looked at us, her eyes lit up. She said, Oh boy, oh boy, so good to see you, John and Pat. And she shuffled forward to hug me. It was my mom. I gave her a hug, but it was awkward. I, I had never even used the word mom before. But there was another reason that I felt so awkward. We were in the waiting room of a mental institution. My mom was a patient. No one told us that she suffered from schizophrenia a severe form of mental illness. We made that discovery on the day that we saw in the waiting room. Now, it would take me years to digest how such a meeting impacted me. I now know, for example, that one of the reasons my family didn't tell me about my mom's illness is because they didn't know how. When I met my mom in the, the mid-1980s, few people talked openly about mental illness. But, when I met her that day, I could sense that my attitudes toward race began to shift. The place where she stayed was notorious for mistreating patients. They would chain them to beds and subject them to unwanted medical experiments. And as I looked at my mom and realized that she had been staying in this hellish place for so long, I vividly remember thinking this, I didn't know a white person could suffer like this. Before that meeting, I thought that no white person could relate to what it meant to be black, to be ignored, to be reviled, to be treated with contempt. My mother shattered that assumption within the first 15 minutes of that meeting. As we rose to leave, 
she made an odd request to me. She said, John, will you send me a St. Jude prayer book? My mom, I will learn later, is a devout Irish Catholic, and St. Jude was a patron saint of hopeless causes. She saw herself as a hopeless cause. More meetings followed, and I got to know her. And I, I even began to tell some of my friends, yeah, my mom's white. I even joined the interracial church at the time when I became friendly with a few white members. I thought I had changed. But two events took place that showed me how difficult change can be. One you may remember. It started with the video. A group of white police officers pull a black man out of a car. They pin him to the ground and brutalize him as he begs for mercy. I'm talking, of course, about the Rodney King protest that erupted in 1992 after a man named Rodney King was pulled over and beaten by police officers. That was one of the first news stories I covered as a rookie newspaper reporter. And what I discovered as I be began to cover other events like this in places like Charlottesville and Ferguson is that they all followed the same script. Some act of raw racism will be caught on film. White moral outrage would erupt across the country. Protests would follow. People would call it a racial reckoning. And then within months, that outrage would follow. And there would be a return to the status quo. And then something else happened during that time that only deepened my cynicism. I began to meet other members of my mother's family. One in particular stood out. It was my mother's younger sister, Mary. She requested a meeting with me when I was in my mid-20s. I didn't want to meet her. I said, why should I meet you now? Where were you when I was a kid when I needed you? But I met her because I thought she wanted to apologize. We met and talked, no apology. We talked again, no apology. This went on for a while until finally one day I asked her. I said, why didn't you reach out to me when I was younger? Was it because I'm black? She paused carefully and then she said, no, it wasn't because you're black. It's because you're not Catholic. I was raised not to associate with non-Catholics. I said nothing, but I was bullying inside. And yet we continue to talk. Now this might seem odd to some people. Why would I continue to talk to her? But I did it partly out of self-interest. She knew my mom better than anyone before my mom became ill. So as she told me these stories about my mom and about other members of my family, I not only began to understand my mom, I began to understand myself. And so we continued to talk. And this went on for a while until something happened that I never saw coming. I experienced a racial reckoning. And of all places, the Lowe's Home Improvement Store in Midtown Atlanta. <laughs> I went to Lowe's one Saturday morning to get paint for my backyard deck. I saw two Lowe's employees behind the counter. One was white, one was black. The white man was on the phone busy. The black man was free. I waited for about five minutes until the white man was off the phone. Then I went up to him, I said, can you give me the correct paint for my backyard deck? And I remember taking the paint home and pouring it out to the paint tray and just becoming disgusted when I saw this rainbow colored concoction pour out. And then it hit me. I subconsciously picked the white man because I thought he was more competent than the black man. And I said, wow, I just racially profiled a black man and I'm black. That experience humbled me. And I did something I had never done before. My aunt had written me all these letters over the years. At first I opened them but then I stopped opening them because I didn't hear that apology. But I kept them in a box under my desk. And I went through that box and I opened up these letters one by one. Then I realized everything I wanted from her was already in those letters. She apologized for not reaching out to me when I was younger. And she confessed, she said, I didn't want anyone to know that I had two black nephews. And then she said, I grew up in an all white world where we never saw black people. When I went to school, they didn't even talk about things like the civil rights. She wrote, I thought the only racist were people who owned slaves. 
And then she added more. She said, if you don't want to talk to me anymore, if you're that angry with me, I understand. But I want to tell you that I appreciate you listening to me all these years and not condemning me. Our relationship changed after that. It changed in ways that I never expected. One day, that change came to me in a more dramatic way. She said two words that I never expected. I had called her one day to apologize for something. And she said, oh, don't worry about it. We're family. We're family. How did this change happen? That's a complicated question, and there's no one part to that answer. But two words from social science helped me understand part of this change. Have you ever heard of contact theory? This is a term that was coined by one of the 20th century's greatest psychologists, Gordon Allport, in his book, The Nature of Prejudice. In the book, he says, racial prejudice will decline between groups when they have sustained contact with one another over a period of time, but it has to be contact under certain conditions. They have to share roughly equal status, and they have to come together for a larger common goal that goes beyond racial reconciliation. Think about all the sports movies you've seen, like Remember the Titans, where white, black, and brown players are divided by race. They, but they come together. They get to learn one another. And they, and they vie to win the championship. And in doing so, all those racial differences evaporate. That's contact theory at work. I believe that one of the reasons my aunt changed is because some of the same dynamics that contact theory were at work in our relationship. We were forced to come in contact with one another in a sustained relationship that lasted years because of a larger common purpose that went beyond race. We had to take care of my mom and we had to learn how to become a family. And over that time, she ceased to become a category, the white woman, and she became an individual, Aunt Mary. It was incredibly moving that this happened. That experience with my mother's family, as well as all the so-called racial reckonings I've covered as a reporter, has led me to this one bedrock conclusion. Facts don't change people. Relationships do. Now that sounds so simple, but it runs counter to the way we often talk about racism today. I often hear people give the most brilliant and nuanced explanations and solutions for attacking racism, but not once will they talk about the importance of building integrated communities and creating these interracial relationships. Why is that? I have an idea why. Look at us. Look at how divided we are. There are people who can barely have contact with a relative during Thanksgiving who has different political beliefs. Adding race to the mix is an even bigger hurdle. And then there's something I see in my job. I meet so many people who seem pessimistic, who like they've given up on America. They say transformational change is not possible. Ordinary people have no power. I too have felt that pessimism. But when I do, I sometimes think about my mom and what she did. When my parents began dating in the mid-1960s, over 90% of Americans opposed interracial marriage. Last year, a Gallup poll revealed that 94% of Americans now approve of interracial marriages, and that cuts across all political lines. Interracial marriages, biracial children, are now so commonplace that often we don't consider, how did this dramatic shift take place? It took place in part because of what one of my favorite authors, Eric Liu, an activist, calls contagion. Eric says, norms change before policy change. Norms change when ordinary people decide they're going to do something they think is right. They don't wait for the courts or politicians to decide. They act in their private lives. This creates a ripple effect as others join in, and a new norm is created. That's the dynamic that gave us marriage equality. Long before the Supreme Court decided that gay marriage was constitutional, countless gay and lesbian people came out to their friends and their families and their workplaces, and they created a new norm. Love is love, regardless of sexual orientation. That's the same dynamic that gave us interracial marriage. 
Countless people, like my parents, came out long before it was cool, and they created a new norm. Love is love, regardless of someone's skin color. Now, I would be lying if I tried to say my mom was a civil rights crusader. We ever, hardly ever talked about race. And there are times I've asked myself, did she see my mom in part because of her illness? I don't know, and I never will. But I do know this. She did something that was so rare in the mid-60s for a white American. She saw that she had a common humanity with black people, and she was willing to put those beliefs into action and pay a price for that. She was one of the bravest people I've ever knew. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying if just black, white, and brown people hug one another, racism will disappear. Racism is also about power, not just personal feelings. As Frederick Douglass once said, power can seize nothing without a man, demand. It never has, and it never will. But what I am saying is this, that building interracial relationships and creating these integrated communities is also an indispensable tool in fighting racism. And I wonder if we've forgotten that. We shouldn't. Because whenever you reach out to someone you think is an enemy, whenever you join a community where not everyone looks and thinks alike, you too are creating that contagion. And you may find that people can change in ways you never imagined. My mother was not a hopeless cause. She had more power than she realized. And so do we. Thank you.